chapter 22. Um, we're going to be looking today at, uh, at trials. How many of you, by, by show of hands, how many of you have gone through or maybe are going through an incredible trial? I think I see a show of hands. Some of you this morning, you, uh, you know, it's been, you know, they talk about motorcycle riders. There's two types, those that have been down, those that are going down. That's kind of the way it is for us living in this world. We, we experience trials. We go through them. Um, and uh, some of you this morning, maybe you don't even raise your hand. You're going through such a trial this morning. You just kind of are in your shell. You're just kind of closed up. And so we're going to be looking at trials. This is not an exhaustive teaching on trials, but it is sort of <clears throat> looking at the big E on the I chart of uh, why trials? Why does God allow them? And so we're going to be looking that, at that in, uh, in our text today. Um, let's pick it up in verse 31. Uh, it says, The Lord God said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. I want you to think about the context of what has been going on. They're at the Last Supper here. And, uh, and we have been seeing Jesus. He's trying to pour into his disciples. He's trying to ready them for what's coming, but they are not making it easy, you know. And, and so here he's been talking about a hugely significant event that he is going to the cross. And rather than appreciating the significance of the moment of what's going on, they're arguing about their significance, and rather than, rather than appreciating the greatness of what Jesus is going to do, they're arguing about their greatness, right? And so, so here, just on the heels of arguing about who's the greatest, here you got Jesus looking at Simon. He's like, Simon, Simon. And the text doesn't say this, but I kind of see Jesus slapping his forehead before he says this, Simon, Simon. Kind of, you get the impression maybe Simon was sort of at the center of that argument about who's the greatest. You know, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he, Simon, said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. So here we are, this is all going down, and we saw Jesus and have seen Jesus and are seeing Jesus now trying to prepare these guys. Um, last week, you know, he did a couple of things. He exhorted them uh, and he encouraged them. And today what he's doing is he's trying to equip them. Um, and, uh, and so the, the exhortation, hey, the exhortation of the greatness of serving, the encouraging, hey, there's going to be a reward for you guys that is yet to come in heaven. We looked at those two things last week. This week, Jesus is all about equipping them for the great trials that lie ahead. And so he says, hey, Simon, listen, Satan's asked for you. He wants to sift you like wheat. And, of course, Peter's response is... No, that's not going to happen to me. These losers, they might, they might go through it, but, but, but that will never happen to me. And I'm sure, I'm sure that Simon meant it with all of his heart, right? You ever said things to, to the Lord, maybe even in worship? Sometimes, let's just be honest, sometimes we sing these songs and there's these incredible lyrics and there's a part of us that goes, can I sing this? Is this really true in my heart? Right? Sometimes we sing them with all of our heart, with great abandon. Lord, you know, we, the, they have these, what I like to call pledge songs, you know, that I'll love you, I'll always love you, and I'll, you know, whatever, you know, it is. And then what do we do? Doggone it, before we even get in our cars, we, we have, you know, somehow denied the Lord or, or you know, been uh, less than. We just pledged, you know, five minutes ago that we would be, you know. And, uh, and so Peter said, look, this is never going to happen. Now, understand about Peter, this, this guy, he's, he's actually a big, strong guy. Historians say that Peter was big and that he was strong. And if you read the end of John's gospel, you actually, you get a picture of that. You know, Jesus tells him, hey, go get some of the fish you just caught. Well, and the text just has told us that there was like a, over 150 large fish 
that were in the net. So let's just be conservative and say they, they were three pounders, you know. That's almost 500 pounds. And the net is wet and saturated and heavy, and Peter single-handedly drags this up on shore. Now, why do I emphasize that? Well, because you've got a guy in Peter, by the way, on, a, on an Enneagram test, he's probably an eight. He's just this driven sort of guy, you know. Um, and I wouldn't know anything about that. But at any rate, um, he's this driven guy. And, uh, and he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's all in, leads with his heart, um, and he's the first one to, to, to charge out and to go and to do something. You know, they're in the boat. John goes, oh, that's the Lord. Peter doesn't even take off his clothes. He just dives in, starts swimming to the Lord. This is Peter. He's a ready, shoot, aim kind of guy, you know. And, um, and, you know, the sense of Peter is that, you know, being a big, strong guy, being a guy that leads with his heart, um, he probably, just because of his physical stature and his confidence, was able to do a lot in his own strength, right? Uh, somebody asked me the question one time, and I'll, this will be part of our questions to take a walk with at the end of the sermon today. Um, you know, what are you dangerously good at? What is it that, you, that your natural giftings, your natural strengths uh, are, are, are make it easy for you to, to, to depend on those natural strengths. That can be a blessing, but, you know, it can also be a curse. And so Peter, here's a guy, he, you know, it's been said there's three kinds of people in the world, those that, that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that ask what happened, right? And, um, and <laughs> Peter, he was a guy typically that made things happen, right? But he was also impulsive, and um, so here he is, and that gets him into trouble, and he's like, Jesus, this ain't going to go down. I, these, these losers, yeah, I can see that, that, that you know, you might want to, you know, be praying for them, but, but hey, you know, I'm, 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 I'm ready to go with you even, you know, to die. And um, so it's interesting. Jesus, he says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, you might think, because he's prefaced what he said by saying, Simon, Simon, that he's just saying this to Simon. That when, when Jesus says si that Satan has asked for you, that, hey, he's asked for you, Simon, in particular. And, and it's interesting, that's, that's the, the, the pronoun that Jesus uses, that word you. It's actually in the plural. And what Jesus is saying to, to Simon is he's saying, look, Satan has asked for all y'all. He's asked for all of you to sift you as wheat. Now, let's unpack that statement, to sift you as wheat. Um, there's huge implications of what Jesus has said, that he wants to sift you, all of you, as wheat. And um, we understand now, uh, in, in hindsight, kind of what he was talking about. In this day and age, they would have under, understood immediately. This is an agrarian society. They l made their life by farming. So sifting wheat was something that was very familiar to all of them, had huge implications. Now, understand, sifting is the process by which you separate the chaff from the wheat, Chaff is the scaly exterior shell of the wheat seed, okay? And it is, uh, it, 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 there's a couple things about chaff. One, it adheres very strongly to the seed. It is adhered to it. Uh, and number two, it's actually worthless to you on a digestive level. Um, does nothing for the human body. You, you actually cannot digest chaff. And so you have to remove chaff. And in order to remove chaff, there's a two-part process of threshing and winnowing. Threshing is accomplished by literally crushing the wheat seed. And winnowing then is accomplished by shaking and tossing the wheat. And here's how they did it in this day. An ox, first of all, would drag a wooden sled. And the wooden sled was, was called a tribulum interesting word, we get the word tribulation uh, from that, wor that word. And that wooden sled, what it would do is it would crush the wheat seed. Why is that necessary? Well, because the chaff is adhered to it. So by crushing the seed, you were actually breaking up the chaff. And then what would happen is, um, having done this, the seed would then be shaken and tossed. 
you shake the seed after it's been crushed, you toss it up into the air, and the hope is that the chaff, being lighter than the wheat seed, would, the wind would catch the chaff and blow the chaff away. And you're left with just that, which uh, is your goal, your objective, the wheat seed alone with no chaff whatsoever. Now, the Bible repeatedly likens chaff to sin and ungodliness. And, and I think it's a, it's a great metaphor because you think about, you know, how chaff adheres to the wheat um, and, uh, and sin for us, ungodliness for us, um, is something that, that is adhered to us, right? And, and, and the thing is, we live in this fallen world. We live in a fallen world where, where sin prevails, and, uh, and so the, the Bible likens chaff to sin and ungodliness. Listen to what the psalmist said, Psalm 1-4. The ungodly are like the chaff which the wind drives away. John the Baptist, he was talking about chaff. He's, he, 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 he was readying people. He's out there baptizing and he's heralding the coming of Jesus. And he said uh, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 3, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who's greater than I am. He, speaking of Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate, here it is, the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. And then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. How does Jesus do that? Listen very carefully. He allows us to be sifted. That process of crushing, of shaking, and of being tossed around. How many of you can relate? Maybe even today. You've been going through a crushing. You've been going through a shaking. And Jesus makes it clear again here in verse 31, this is a plural request. Hey, Peter, Satan hasn't just asked for you. He's asked for all y'all. He, he's asked for James and John and Af Andrew and Bartholomew. And you know who else Satan desires to sift? You. He wants to, do, he wants to sift you. He wants to crush you. He wants to shake you. He wants to toss you. Peter said this. He said, be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Listen, this is the enemy's plan for you. And if that's not unsettling enough, I want you to notice the text seems to indicate that he's asking for these guys by name. He's asking for them by name. Now, we generally like it when people know our names, don't we? Right? Captain Jack Sparrow, I've heard of you. I heard you're the worst captain around. And what's his response? But you have heard of me, right? We like people to know our name. But here's the deal. When it's Satan who knows your name, that ain't so cool, right? You're like, oh, wait a minute. I don't like the fact that he knows my name, right? And <clears throat> so when Jesus tells Peter, hey, Satan has asked for you, Here's what you need to understand. When he says he's asked for you, that's not some casual, hey, Jesus, you know, if it wouldn't be too much problem, would you, could I have these guys, you know? Could I sift these guys? You know, just, hey, if it, if it works into your schedule and all, would this be all right? That's not what that word asked means. In the Greek, that word asked, it means Satan begged for them. Begged for them. Let me illustrate it this way. My son used to have a golden retriever, and um, it, you know, it, long story. Basically, when he was he was doing uh, a TV show, uh, Seventh Heaven, and his character on the show had a golden retriever, and Brenda used to watch him interact with this golden retriever on the set, and she's like, "This kid needs a golden retriever." So she went out one day and she bought him a golden retriever. Now he was in school; he didn't know this, and she took Caitlin, my daughter, with her to get this to get this dog, this little puppy. And Caitlin, they get in the car, and Caitlin goes, I'm naming her Boo. And Brenda says, well, it's your brother's dog. He's got to name the dog. And so Scotty gets into the car, and he's like, oh, my gosh, he's taken with the dog. And Caitlin says, oh, isn't she beautiful? Her name's Boo. And Scotty's like, oh, hi, Boo. You know, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we get this dog. And the, the trainers on the set helped us 
with some tips on how to train her. So she was a cool dog, man. She would sit. She would lie down. She would bark without saying a word. You just do this, and she would bark on command. Um, and then we taught her. We put a bell on the back door, and when she had to go outside, um, we house trained her, and she would just ring the bell, and we would let her out. But Boo was smarter than us because she realized that when she rang the bell that we would get up and go to her, right? And so it became the servant's bell. (laughs) Well, here's what she used the servant's bell for. Boo, being a golden retriever, was crazy about a ball, right? Specifically tennis balls. She would lose her mind. We, we would have this tennis ball, and she would, we throw it, she'd go get it, she'd bring it right back, she'd drop it on our feet, throw it again, you know? But then she would lose this ball, it would go under our couch, and you would just get sick of the dog for constantly bringing you this slobbered ball. It's like, oh my gosh, just get out of here, you're bugging me. And she would beg us and beg us and beg us and beg us, and if we weren't doing it, what would she do? She'd go ring the bell. And we'd get up and we'd go to her and say, oh, great, God, you're here. She'd run over and point, you know, go get my ball again, right? This is Satan. He's begging. He's begging. Give me these guys. Give me these guys. Give me these guys. Now, here's the thing. Just because Boo begged doesn't mean she always got the ball. Sometimes we'd be like, you're done with the ball. No more ball for you, you know? So Satan, he, I'm sure there are times when he's begging And God says no, right? Very significant. We think of Satan as, you know, he's hiding behind every bush, every rock, every tree, and he's just going to attack. Now, he does prowl around like a roaring lion looking for whom he's going to devour, just as Peter warned. But he's got to go by Jesus. He's got to pass it by God, whether or not he's going to be able to do this thing. Now, we don't just take this from this this teaching, this doctrine from this verse here uh, alone. We see it elsewhere in Scripture. Job, in Job chapter 1, uh, we have this scene, there's different people, it's, the scene is in heaven, different people appearing before God, all of a sudden Satan's there. And so uh, God says, where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, I've been watching everything that's going on. And then the Lord God asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? Now, that word noticed, it it is a military term. Have you observed my servant Joe or noticed him? Uh, It means to surveil. It means to scrutinize. It means to to do so strategically in order to find a witness that you might be able to attack. And, And we're all at this point going, please, God, don't ever say, have you noticed my servant, you know, Ted, uh, you know, Erica, whatever. You know, you don't want God saying that. But he says this to Satan. He's like, hey. Have you, have you gone and looked for Job's weakness? Have you seen an, tried to find an area in his life where you can attack? And so he says, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless. He's a man of complete integrity. He fears God and he stays away from evil. Satan answers in verse 9. He says, he replies to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take everything away that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And what's God's response? He says, all right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses but don't harm him physically. And so Satan left the Lord's presence. And we know, going through the book of Job, he really attacked him with a vengeance, right? Now, why on earth would God allow this? Why would God allow him to go after him and to attack him? Here's why. Because Jesus has a purpose in our sifting to separate us from the chaff. Jesus has a purpose in our sifting to separate us from the chaff. Because here's the thing about the chaff in your life. Remember, chaff is representative of sin and ungodliness. And there are things in our life that we don't recognize always as chaff. Right? Now, sometimes you do and you're just hanging on to it. But sometimes there's those things, you know, it's been said that even good things uh, can become idols if we allow a good thing to become a God thing. Right? And sometimes things happen in our life where God recognizes that's chaff. 
in your life. And, and I got to sift that out. And so God has a purpose in allowing Satan to sift us so that he might separate us, that wheat kernel, from the chaff in our life. Paul said this to the Philippians. He said, God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now that phrase, finally finished, in the Greek it means to accomplish perfectly. And that should ring some bells for you because we hear that somewhere else in Scripture. We hear it in the book of James. Ladies, you're going to be going through this soon in your study through the book of James. But listen to what the Lord says through James in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. He says, My brethren, count it all joy (coughs) when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have, here it is, its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. That doesn't mean that you consider the trial itself joy. What that is helpful to do is to remind us that we need to keep a joyful heart knowing that God is going to use this to perfect me. Now, here's the thing. Um... Doctrine is important. We place a high premium here on, on teaching the Bible. We, we go through books of the Bible. I teach through books of the Bible, and I do my best to teach you chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And here's why that's so important. Because in the teaching of the Bible to you, what's going to happen is it is going to inform your doctrine. And doctrine is so important because when you go through various trials in your life, when you just go through life, period, everything in your life is going to be filtered by the doctrine that you hold. Your belief and your understanding about who God is and what he wants to do in your life. It is all accomplished through you maturing in your faith. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you've got really bad doctrine where God's intentions are in regards to money. Let's say that you you hold to some sort of a prosperity teaching where you think God wants you to be rich and uh, and his every endeavor is, is to bless you and prosper you and make you financially rich. Now, God does want to bless you and God does want to prosper you. But blessing and prospering isn't always synonymous with financial riches. How many of you have discovered that? Right? And, and so if your doctrine, if your, if your Christian understanding is that God is the equivalent of a genie who's going to grant you three wishes, you are in for a shock because you're going to go through times where maybe God recognizes in your life that money has become an idol. And God is saying, look... Uh, that's the last thing on the earth that I'm going to do for you right now. Because I need to break that, I need to, to separate you from that chaff in your life. And so when God does these things, when he allows things in our life, and we go through some sort of a, a financial thing, maybe we've got a misunderstanding with God doctrinally that, hey, whatever I do, <coughs> God's going to have to, you know, hey, I've worked for you, I've served you, I've made all these sacrifices for you, and so I've got blessings stored up. I've got blessings coming. And then God doesn't deliver. And you're thinking, wow, why, why do I have to drive this junky car? Like I do all this stuff for God and I should have a better car or whatever the case may be. That's poor doctrine. And so it's so critically important that we understand and hold to the fact that, look, God's going to work in my life because at the end of the day, it's just like we told our kids growing up. I'm not so much interested in your happiness, I'm interested in your holiness. Being separated unto God. If, if, if I focus on making you a godly person, then what I know is that joy is going to be the result of that in your life. And so, just understand, what is it that Jesus said? Just last week, in verse 28, he said to us, he was encouraging his disciples. He's talking to them about, you know, what he's going to go through and all, and he's talking to them about how they should be servant-hearted, not be like those that live puffed up and want to exercise lordship over everybody, but, you know, hey, he who wants to be first among you must be the servant of all kind of thing. And then to encourage them, he's saying, look, there's a reward that's awaiting you in heaven. 
Those that have, you guys are those that have continued with me in my trials. You're going to be rewarded in heaven. You've got something to look forward to. But what he tells them now is that, yeah, you've been with me in my trials, but you're going to go through trials yourself. No servant is greater than his master, Jesus would tell his disciples. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you as well. And so <coughs> he's saying, look, you're going to go through trials as well. They're going to crush you. They're going to shake you. They're going to toss you because Satan wants to sift you like wheat, and that's what it looks like. But at the end of it, you're going to be separated from the chaff. So listen, Jesus has a purpose for us in our trials. If you're going through a trial today, what I want you to hear is that the Lord has a purpose in your trial. He has a purpose for it. Nothing happens to you that takes God by surprise. There's never one example where he goes, wait a minute, Satan, I didn't know you were going to do that to him. No, like Boo ringing that bell, there's got to be some permission that's granted. And if you're going through trials today, you need to take heart that God is at work and he wants to separate the wheat from the chaff. But I want you to notice, not only does Jesus have a purpose in it, but he also prays for Peter in it, right? He says, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now, prior to this, when he says Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat, he was using that in the, in the plural. He's asked for all y'all. But here now, he says to Peter, hey, Peter, Peter, I prayed for you in particular. How incredible is that? Jesus is literally hours away from being crucified. And it's not something he's looking forward to. You will see, and you'll see it in the weeks to come as we go through this, that he begs God. He's like, look, if there's any other way for this to be accomplished, let this be removed from me. He's not looking forward to this in the sense of what he's going to have to physically endure. <clears throat> but yet somehow in the midst of all of that, hey, Peter, I've taken the time to pray for you. And Peter, I prayed for you by name. So encouraging. And listen, in the craziness of what you're going through today, in the craziness of the world that we live in today, the Bible tells us that Jesus is praying for you in the same way that he paid, prayed for Peter. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, it says, because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. Here it is, listen, he lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. You could just put your name right in there. Right now, this moment, Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's praying for you by name. Whatever trial you're going through, whatever burden you're carrying today, and, and you know, it, it gets so hard when we go through these things. We think, where are you, God? Don't you see? Don't you care? Yeah. He's working. He is working. <clears throat> and I, know, I want you to notice, what is it that Jesus prays for Peter specifically? He doesn't say, hey, Satan has asked for you, and I've prayed that he wouldn't get to you. He doesn't say, hey, Satan has asked for you, Peter, and, I, and I'm praying that you know, you're, you're, you're completely protected and, and all, just as you know, Satan said about Job. You've put, a, you've put a, a wall of protection. Some translations say you've put a hedge of protection about him. And God says, fine, I'll take it away. Have at him kind of thing. This is where we get that phrase, by the way, hedge of protection. We might be praying. Somebody might have prayed. Lord, put a hedge of protection around him. You're thinking, I want something a little stronger than a hedge. Come on, God, you know. But that's where the idea comes from, that sometimes God does put that protection around you. Sometimes... He removes it. He says, all right, Satan. This is, and, but he sets limits on it. This is, this is only how far you can go with Job. You can't take his life. But I'll let you go up until this point. Why? Because he's doing this work, right? <coughs> so Peter, or so the Lord, in praying for Peter, he doesn't pray that Peter would be protected from the trial altogether. He says, I pray that your faith won't fail. See, because that's the thing. You are going to fail. Can I just tell you, you're going to fail. You're going to be tempted like Peter. You're going to insist, no, I'll never do that. And then to your shock and dismay, you're going to find that it's true when you are sifted. When it happens, man, wow, it's a tough thing. I think about the Apostle Paul. He was writing to the Corinthians. Um, 
he was talking to them about how God had given him a glimpse of heaven. And, um, and he said that he saw things there that were too amazing to even write. He's like, I, I couldn't even write about it. I can't even describe it because I wouldn't do it justice kind of thing. But then he said this. He said, even though I have received, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God to keep me from being proud... I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Paul was basically saying, look, I saw all these wonderful things, but God allowed the enemy to get to me. Now, he describes this as a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what the thing was. We don't know what the thorn was. Some historians think that he was afflicted with something adverse with his eyesight. And, uh, and you read this, and the way that it's that is phrased there, you kind of think of it as one and the same, that the thorn was the messenger from Satan. But that doesn't seem to be the case as you study that verse. What it seems to be is that God allowed his eyesight to be afflicted, and he allowed a messenger from Satan to torment him. And so the idea here is that the enemy, he's just not content to be able to afflict you or attack you, he wants to shake you, to crush you and all, because he's hoping that there ain't nothing more to you than a bunch of chaff. And that he's going to do all this stuff, and at the end of it, what's going to be revealed <coughs> is that there is no wheat kernel in you, that you're nothing but sin through and through. So he wants to crush you and do all of these things, and then what he does on top of it is he goes after your faith. And so what seems to, Paul seems to be telling the Corinthians is, look, I had this affliction. God allowed Satan to attack me in this way. And then there's this messenger from Satan tormenting me, basically telling him lies. And the enemy tells you lies. You know that. You've been through that. You experience that. You go through some kind of a testing. You go through some kind of a crushing. And you think, God, where are you? You don't see. You don't care. You've forsaken me. Or you think, oh, this is, I've got this coming. God's mad at me. And, you know, you have some sort of, again, theology. And you've got some sort of a bad theology that when I'm a good boy, God's good to me. But man, when I'm bad, God's going to destroy me. And he's mad at me. And, and he's punishing me. Bad theology. Now, God will cause you to go through these different afflictions to remove the chaff. But it's not because he's punishing you. It's because he loves you. And, and, and he is refining you, right? And so, so you go through these things, and what, what's going on with Paul is the enemy's right there going, you're an apostle? God loves you? No, you're, you're on the mission field. Like, you need your eyesight, and, and God's abandoned you. He doesn't care about you. This is the tormenting that's going on, Right? Peter faced the same things. He faced the same things. We don't have time to get into it today, but when we get a little further on here in chapter 22, you're going to see that everything that Jesus warned Peter that was going to happen goes down. And so not only does he desert Jesus in the desert, but he denies him three times before the sun rises. The sun's already set. It's nighttime, and Jesus is saying, hey, before the sun even rises, you're going to forsake me, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, that's never going to happen. Yeah, it happened. And when it happened, when that rooster crowed, verse 64 basically says that he, or 60, um, 61, uh, 62, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. And man, the enemy piled on. And here's how we know this. Peter was so worked over by the enemy. You get to John's gospel, and you see there in John chapter 21, Peter basically goes, guys, I'm going back to fishing. Now, the way the text reads, he just says, I'm going fishing. But the, you, you get the implication in the original language. He's saying, I'm going back to fishing. Like, I, I blew it as an apostle. I'm, I, clearly, I'm worthless. I don't deserve to do all this stuff. What's happening? The enemy is getting to him. The enemy's getting to him. He's going to quit being an apostle. But I want you to notice Jesus is faithful. I want you to know he's faithful. We read in one of the gospel accounts, in, it's actually in Mark chapter 16, when Jesus rises from the dead, Mary, and Magd Mary Magdalene and Mary, uh, the mother of James, they go to the tomb, and an angel appears to them. Listen to what the angel says. He says to them, go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Hear God's heart in this. 
He, he's, he, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. You're going to go through this time of testing. You're going to go through this time of trial. <clears throat> he's in the thick of it. God sends an angel and says, make sure you tell Peter that Jesus has risen from the dead. God's encouraging him. He doesn't want his faith, faith to fail. We read in about a, an account in one of the Gospels about you know, the disciples that are on the road to Emmaus. Jesus <clears throat> has died and he's, he's been entombed there. And, and these disciples, they're, they're walking on the road to Emmaus. They're bummed out. And Jesus joins them. They don't know it's Jesus. And he's like, what are you talking about? And they're like, what are you new? You don't know about everything that's going on here in Jerusalem? And they start talking about Jesus sort of in the past tense and in, and in uh, defeated terms. Like, oh, we had hoped that he was the one. Well, apparently he wasn't, but we had hoped that he was. And then Jesus began to speak to them. And their hearts are burning inside them and, and just begins to share all the scriptures that talk about Jesus to encourage them in their faith. And then all of a sudden, he, he disappears and they realize, oh my gosh, that was Jesus. Now, what they do then is they run back to Jerusalem. And one of the things they say when they run back to everybody and start talking to people in Jerusalem, they say, the Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. And we don't read about that, but here's the implication. Somewhere along the lines, Jesus not only did send an angel to tell Mary uh, Magdalene and, and Mary the mother of James, hey, <clears throat> that, that make sure you tell Peter that the Lord has risen from the dead. The Lord himself appeared to Peter at some point to encourage him. What's the point? Hey, don't let your faith fail. You're going to be crushed. You're going to go through times of trial and hardship, but don't let your faith fail. Listen, we're going to fail. We're going to have... The best intentions like Peter, we're going to have every desire to honor God like Peter, but God's going to allow us to be tested. He's going to allow us to be sifted, and sometimes in the sifting, our faith is going to be shaken. But listen, God's working, and I don't want you to doubt that for a second. He's working in your life. He's working. He's removing the chaff. Because listen, the world that we live in is starving. For the truth. They're starving for wheat, and they're supposed to get that from us, right? And even though Peter failed Jesus, God is going to use this failure to get rid of the chaff, and he gets rid of the chaff in Peter's life. He, he gets his self-confidence sifted away. He, he gets his pride about being the greatest sifted away. He, he, this man, so strong, so used to depending on his flesh, that's getting sifted away. And after Peter is sifted, what we see is Jesus saying, look, I've prayed that your faith won't fail, and when you have been tested, and when you come back, when you return to me, it's a picture of repentance. Strengthen your brethren. Peter does exactly that. We read about him strengthening the, the brethren. All, I mean, first, first and second Peter is all about strengthening hurting Christians. We see Peter, a man who's been sifted, who's had the chaff taken away from his life, and you read there in Acts chapter 2, after he's sifted, preaches, three, preaches a message, 3,000 people get saved. Acts chapter 3, after he's been sifted, he preaches another message, 5,000 people are saved. That's a man not depending on his flesh, but who has been sifted by God. Acts chapter 10, after having been sifted, he brings the gospel to the Gentiles. And after having been sifted, he writes First and Second Peter among them. Here's what he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. You think Peter knows this from firsthand experience? He's like, man, I know. I've been sifted. I know what it is to think, what is this thing that's going on in my life? He says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. Listen, I wonder as we close right now, if you're being sifted. It's been said that the difference between where you are and where God wants you to be is the painful experience that you refuse to endure. Listen, God might be sifting you. He might be crushing you. But there's a work that he wants to do in you of removing the chaff from your life. Will you trust him? Will you trust him?